things, things like that, give everybody a chance to hop on. like things are working connected there all right 15 minutes we're gonna get started that this time I'll be able to more easily see the comments Get in, it looks like. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Don Buckley, holy cow. How are you, man? Don Buckley was the uh, fire marshal for Draper City when I inspected there. Far out, man. Las Vegas is in the house. Milwaukee. What are you doing up there in Milwaukee, Joe? I thought you were in New Jersey. Chris, you like the caution tape? Yeah, it's pretty good, man. Um, a friend of mine named Joe Tedesco out of Boston uh, sent me that pic. Oh, geez, probably 20 years ago, I'll bet. Stephen Hall, how you doing? I saw you earlier. Okay, Chuck, perfect timing for the end of your class. Awesome. I'm glad that you made a comment, Chuck, because I wanted to check a setting. Let's see, over there. Cool, okay. So I can, I can use that screen to read YouTube so I won't have to turn to my monitor, which I hate doing because I, one of the things that I've taught myself to do over the years, and if you're an instructor, I think this is really important. Um, if you have a laser pointer, if you use a laser, a laser pointer, the, the tendency is you'll, you'll hit the little green light or whatever, and you'll shine it behind you, and you talk to the wall. And you lose your audience because you need to be watching your audience the whole time when you're an, when you're an instructor. So for me, the last couple of live streams have been have been really tough because I feel like I have to take my eyes off the audience, even though I, I know you guys can still see me and everything, but to me, I, I'm still talking to an audience. So when I have to go down here, I, I, I feel like I've disconnected something. Does that make any sense? So I'm glad that I'll be able to look at the YouTube stuff up there. Um, I know my finger seems to be kind of fading in and out. Oh, you know what it is. I was passing my hand in front of a microphone and uh, that was taking it out. So I haven't dropped any frames on the live stream, so that's good. Uh, that uh, speaks to the quality of the, uh, of the upload. If I switch over to... Okay, so I can delete YouTube there. If I switch over to Facebook here... I want to see if I can read comments. Okay, Lucas in the house. Sam Person, Matthew, outstanding. Guys, love it. So, I can see everybody on my business page. If I click over here, I can get my personal page. I've got Earl, David, Robert, 
Aaron, what do we got? Texas, Virginia Beach. Nice. Outstanding. Uh, David is in New England. I want to say New Hampshire, but it could be Vermont. I think you're in New Hampshire. And Earl, you're in Colorado. Oh, wow. Matt from the IPP Power Plant, my favorite place in the world to teach. And guys, if you ever have a chance to tour a power plant, you will know why it's my favorite place in the world to teach. Absolutely unbelievable. Uh, you guys have seen a lot of uh, a lot of my photographs from there, so you know how cool the power plant is. Kyle from Indianapolis is in the house, calling me a fool, sup fool. Thanks for dinner that time that we went out, Kyle. Appreciate you. On YouTube, I've got Michael Norris from Boston. Good picture, good sound. Thank you. Justin Martinez from Houston is in the house. Outstanding, man. Loving it. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting me know where everybody's from too. We got Dwayne from Wisconsin. We have my dear aunt Barbara from Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho. Rick Mott from Cedar Falls, Iowa. Fort Myers, Florida. Man, look at this. Let's see. Did that just screw everything up? I wonder. California. Nice. All right. So I'm hoping that I'm able to see all of the comments that they don't kind of scroll away. I'm afraid that they're going to, actually. Um, West Virginia, Cincinnati, Ohio, Ohio. Man, everybody's from Ohio. Look at you guys. Virginia, North Carolina, New Bedford, Mass. Mike Rotondo. You guys have got a great quarterback. Oh, yeah, never mind. Sorry about that. Kansas City, Missouri. I was gonna. What was I thinking about Kansas City the other day? I taught there a few months ago. Um, I, I was thinking about. Oh, you know what it was? I, I watched. I finished watching season three of Ozark this morning. That's why I was thinking about Kansas City. Yeah, Barry. Barry Yeslow from China. Nice. How's your uh, How's your cough and uh, watery eyes and everything, Barry, over in China, Illinois? I gotta figure out. <laughs> I gotta figure out how to watch all of these comments. They're all oh, they're they're bombarding me with comments, man. Here they come. I gotta switch over to YouTube. We've got Houston. Oh yeah, get you to your power plant, Chuck. I would love that. South suburbs of Chicago. <laughs> right, and you're here for a Romex class. All right, Chris, you'll love this. <laughs> Have you ever seen Romex before? You know what it is. <laughs> Chicago. If you don't know Chicago, not only do they not use NM cable, they don't use cable. They don't use MC cable, AC cable. They don't even really use flexible metal conduit. You know what they do use in Chicago, though, unlike pretty much anybody anywhere else, is they use flexible metal tubing type FMT Article 360. I don't even cover it in my books. It's so rare, but uh, it's a thing that you'll see in Chicago. Um, checking in from Louisiana, York, Pennsylvania, Orlando. <laughs> Uh, is Mike Holt live today? Yeah, you know what? I forgot all about that. He's going to be on, I think, uh, like an hour later than me. Um, okay, you stay out of the city. All right. <laughs> nice. And let's see here. I had... Yeah, see, I can do... I can get different settings with uh, with the YouTube chat. I just cannot seem to make anything happen on my uh, on my Facebook chat. So, if I go full screen with just me, does that get all weird? I mean, I know like um, I'm, it looks like my head is kind of melting, and that's just because it's like a green screen kind of thing. Um, but is if I go full screen with just me talking, does that make anything weird? Detroit, nice. Will Smith from Chicago. Florida, Sean Collins in the house from the DMV, yo. Columbus, Maryland, Kansas City again. Jeff Thompson from Fort Pierce, Florida, nice. I gotta figure out how I can see these comments. These comments keep on disappearing. So here, I'll, I'll show you guys what I'm looking at here. So 
see the comments just kind of disappear. So it's like, okay, I just saw Colorado, looks good, Kansas City, uh, but then somebody else will comment and it will automatically scroll away. So I don't know how to view them all unless I push play, but I really don't want that to happen either. Green screen's funny though. Well, I you know I'm wondering if um, if the green screen or or if I just need to do my office. I mean I can certainly do my office. Um, I just hate my weird orange wall in my office. One of the you know I could paint. You know that would be an option. Let's see. This is what it's going to look like when we start going. I think I might still do Facebook over here. Let's see. Let me get my YouTube chat back up. Looks good full screen. Okay, cool. Good, good, good. Brian, Brian Rock, code making panel two. And uh, I just, my mind went blank. Hubble, I almost said Leviton. Can I be the guy that's in your phone while you're talking? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Jim Hoover, Joshua Lachute, Brian's in Connecticut. Nice. Love it. It's so good to see all of you guys. So, I wonder if I mute my laptop and push play on my video. Is the <laughs> sounds good? Yeah, man, I don't know how I can see everybody's comments. Um, I Patrick, I can see Facebook, but here's the thing. Um, I can only see like four comments at a time and then they they scroll off the screen and I can't it, it's not like in a group where where you can view all the comments on a thread and this is kind of why I uh, this is why I jumped in early was to try and work out kinks like this because I really want to be able to interact with you guys but I'm not certain that I'm really going to be able to do that um, so I will be able, I, I think once we get started, um, I won't have quite as many comments. So one, right now everybody's just saying hi and what's up, you know, where they're from. Uh, so I'm getting bombarded. But I think once I get started, I'll probably get less comments. And therefore, they won't just disappear off the screen as fast. So... Okay, so if I do that, okay, so I can do that. Okay, Everett, Washington, Clearwater, Wisconsin again, love it. So if I watch my own video on two screens, over there, I can see it. And I've got, I should have bandwidth for days. Um, my internet connection is solid for sure. So I think I'm going to hit the play Sarah, button. Thank you. Justin Martinez from on Houston these. is in the house. Oh, yes. Yes. There, there, there it is. There bandwidth it is. for days. Okay. Um, now we're talking. My internet connection is solid. Okay, for I think sure. I got this. So I think I totally I got this. The comments. I'm going to hit the play button. So I won't be able to type at you guys. That Justin is going to be way Houston too many things. Oh, there it is. 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 So, yeah, Ron Casino just says hello. I think I totally got that. I think I got that. I see Facebook. So, yeah. So, Don and Jackson just showed up. I won't be able to type at you guys. That is just more just a lot of things. There it is. 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 There it is.
Okay, did that do anything? 26 second delays from YouTube to Facebook. No, okay, so obviously something I just did was a problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, now I'm echoing. Okay. Well, I think I need to go back to what I was doing. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you guys this. Okay, everything is all jacked up then. Okay. Then I will have to just go back. Um, I won't be able to get your, yeah, I won't be able to get your comments on Facebook quite as easily. So, okay, that fixed it. Yep, okay, that was what it was then. Um, all right. I get the feel, well, yeah, let's just go with that then. I can still, okay, yeah, because I can still see it over here if I have to. All right, let's do it. Um, let's go ahead and get started, I think. And my Facebook peeps, everybody happy. Crystal Hunter, no big deal, holy cow. Crystal Hunter of what used to be Code Making Panel 6 and Code Making Panel 7, but now it's just Code Making Panel 6 and 7. So, uh, Crystal, how are you? Uh, Crystal is one of my absolute favorite people in the electrical industry. Make no mistake. Um, I talk about her all the time. I think, I think Crystal, I think you changed the industry uh, when it comes to terminations and people understanding the importance of torque. I, I really do think that you, that you made a real significant impact. So uh, I talk about Crystal all the time. Whenever I teach about 110.14, if you ever have a question about terminations, you get in touch with Crystal Hunter. She knows everything about conductor terminations. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and get started, I think. We're going to go to Article 334, non-metallic sheath cable types NM and NMC based on the 2020 National Electrical Code. I think a lot of you guys know me. My name is Ryan Jackson. Uh, this is what I do for a living. I, uh, I teach seminars and I write textbooks and do expert witness work and consulting and different things like that. I'm just kind of I'm an electrical code nerd. That's what I do. I have a website and I even have an email address. So if you want to get in touch with me, by all means, uh, get in touch. And if you have any code questions or anything, I'd be happy to help you out if I can. If I can't, then I'll probably just make something up. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started on Article 334.1, the scope of Article 334. This article, of course, covers the use, installation, and construction of non-metallic sheathed cable. I'm a big believer in reading article scopes. Um, sometimes the scope doesn't tell you a lot of information because it doesn't need to. Sometimes it tells you a critical amount of information. My experience has been if somebody asks me a really hard question, the answer is in definitions or article scopes. That's just something that I found. I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, somebody called me up on the phone. I was driving and he said, hey, Ryan, I got a code question and I'm feeling pretty good. And I'm like, yeah, go ahead, shoot. I'm not going to pull over anything. I'll, I'll just do it off the top of my head. And he says, I'm, I'm wiring a hospital. Okay, I'm going to pull over. <laughs> and he says, then I'm doing the x-ray machine. And I'm like, oh, and I'm going to grab my code book. So I started, I'm thinking x-ray machines, x-ray, that's chapter six, special equipment, article 650, 660, somewhere. So I'm flipping and I go to article 660, x-rays. And he gives me the question and I look up the answer and I tell him the answer. Hang up the phone and just something wasn't right. You know what I mean? One of those things where it's just like, uh, I don't, I'm not confident about what I just said. And I, I turn the page back, go to the scope 660.1, and it says, X-rays. This article covers X-rays for everything except healthcare. This dude was doing a hospital. And it even has an informational note that says, Look, dummy, don't read this article. Go to 517. Go to 517 part 10. Totally different answer. 
had to call him back and apologize. So I'm a big advocate in reading the article scopes, even if it's something dumb like, you know, NM cable. Article covers the use, installation, and construction of non-metallic sheath cable. Nice and easy. Definitions. Non-metallic sheath cable is a factory assemble, assembly of two or more insulated conductors within a non-metallic jacket. So, yeah, just what it sounds like. It's, it's non-metallic. It's a jacket. There you go. The types include NM and NMC. Now, I underlined and have yellow text under NMC, which is showing a 2020 code change. Not that we added NMC, but we actually deleted a type of NM cable called NMS. So right now, NM cable is the, the NM cable that we all know and love. And I try to not say trade terms, but I'm just going to go ahead and say Romex. Right, and NM cable is Romex, you know, and that's a registered trademark of Southwire, and so I, I try not to say that. NMC is a corrosion resistant version of NM cable, hence the C, non metallic sheath cable corrosion resistant. Here's the thing about NMC nobody really makes NMC unless it's also dual listed as UF. Because if you're going to go through the trouble of making a fungal resistant, corrosion resistant cable with a non-metallic jacket, if you look at article 334 for NM and you look at 340 for UF, there's just a lot more you can do with UF cable. So if I'm a manufacturer, why would I manufacture NMC with its limited uses instead of making UF cable that has a lot more permitted uses? So we'll mention that NMC is a thing but to be honest with you, if I've ever seen it in the field, I didn't realize it. Again, because it's going to be dual listed as UF. It used to also cover type NMS cable, non-metallic sheath cable with a signaling conductor, and that was the S. This was back in the 1990s. There was, a, there was a thing that was going to happen called smart homes, and they were going to take over the world. We had an Article 780 that we added in the NEC that was going to cover smart homes, and everybody was going to have a smart home. Your thermostat would talk to your TV, which would talk to your light and your receptacle and your switches, and it was just going to take over the world. And quite frankly, it was too, uh, it was too good for its own, for its own good. It, it, was, it was too sci-fi. It was too advanced. We weren't ready for that in the 90s. Plus... There were some fatal errors that they made with, uh, it was kind of proprietary. So in the 2020, they, they never really, from my understanding, they never made NMS, or if they ever did, they stopped making it 20 years ago. So in the 2020 NEC, they just got rid of NMS cable. So really, what does 334 cover? Covers NM cable. We got a requirement in 334.6 for listing. NM cable and its associated fittings must all be listed products. Now, the requirement for the cable to be listed has been in the code for a few different code cycles, and this cable, of course, is listed. We can see from our label here that this is a listed product. Easy enough, you buy a listed roll of cable, and it makes sense. I mean, this is the backbone of the electrical system of, of a lot of buildings in the United States, so we want listed products. New to the 2017 code, its associated fittings must also be listed. So, associated fittings would include cable clamps like this. That would be a fitting for NM cable. Uh, I want to point out that support hardware uh, is not a fitting. Support hardware is support hardware, and it's regulated in 334.30, and we'll talk about it. But support hardware, generally speaking, does not need to be listed. Only the cable fittings need to be listed. Now, you can go to Article 100 and read the definition of fitting, and some of you might, and you're like, uh, Ryan, cable tie, you know, staples, they might be fittings. I get it. That's not the intent. Uh, there are proposals in the 2020 to clarify that and I hope it gets changed in the 2023. But for right now, the cable and the associated associated fittings have to be listed. So this guy here needs to be listed. I know it's really small here, but you can see the UL certainly doesn't have to be listed by UL. That's one testing lab. It could be uh, CSA as long as it's CSA with the U next to it, United States, or it's uh, Intertech or, you know, there's all sorts of them. FM approvals and, uh, you know, MATLAB. There, there's all sorts of them. One of the questions that comes up, and I know this is blurry, how many cables can I put through a connector? Well, 
you have to follow the instructions. Am I echoing again? No. Okay, good. Cool. I, I saw something out of the corner of my eye about an echo, but I, I didn't scroll. So, um, How many cables can you stick through these fittings legally? Well, the code doesn't care. The code doesn't address it. Uh, that's all per the manufacturer. And now, because we do need listed fittings, we also need to follow the instructions. Once you have a listed product, you have to follow the instructions. That's what 110.3b says. So, how many can you put through there? Get with the manufacturer and they'll let you know. So this particular fitting, uh, I don't remember who manufactures it. Trade size 3 8 for a half inch knockout. It says I can put three 14 or 12 gauge cables. Or I can put uh, two conductor, or so, oh, I'm, you know what, I misread that. For two conductor, 14, 12, and 10 gauge, or three conductor, 14 and 12. How many cables can you put through there? I don't know, whatever they might instruct. Let's see if we have any comments here. I will know if I have a bunch of comments that I probably said something wrong. Okay, da -da -da -da. hello, hello, good evening, howdy, hello, awesome. Wow, I must not have said anything stupid yet, that's remarkable. All right, um, cool, so we're good there. It's always stressful when you have members of the code making panel of that article on your live feed because you know if you say something stupid, you're going to hear about it. What does UF cable stand for? Uh, underground feeder is what UF stands for. Good question. Scrolling up. Lots of thanks and good. Cool. I'm a happy guy. Lots of people joining. Thanks. Okay, so. I don't see any uh, concerns, so I'm going to keep on rolling. Uh, by the way, if you want to chat with me, it's it's easier on my end, and I'm more likely to read it if it's through YouTube, just so you know. Let's get into uses permitted. Article 334's uses permitted uh, has a lot more teeth than most uses permitted. As a matter of fact, the uses permitted art, uh, sections, the dot ten sections of chapter three, a lot of them have an informational note saying, hey man, this isn't a list of everything you can, we can't tell you everything you can do with the cable. But with 334, we kind of do, we're, we're pretty specific. You can use it here, 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 and here. And then as we're going to find out when we get to the uses not permitted, it kind of says, hey, Go back and read uses permitted once again. So the uses permitted for Article 334 uh, is a lot more uh, robust and a lot more meaningful than some of the other uses permitted. Type NM and NMC are allowed as followed in 1 through 5. Number 1, 1 and 2 family dwellings including their accessory structures. Cool. Wiring a house, doing a duplex. Run NM cable, I don't care how big, how tall. Uh, biggest house I ever inspected was 26,000 square. It was all NM cable, no problem there. I've inspected single family dwellings that were four stories, no problem there. Use it as big, tall, doesn't matter. And you can use it in their detached garages, accessory structures, without any special requirements. So that's the easy one. It gets a little bit more tricky once we get into multifamily dwellings. Multifamily dwellings, you can use NM cable. If the multifamily dwelling is permitted to be type 3, 4, or 5 construction. Okay, we're going to explain types 3, 4, and 5 here in just one minute. Uh, and, and by the way, the other types of construction, of course, are types 1 and 2. And there's an Annex E in the back of the NEC. I don't use it, I don't refer to it, because it's based on NFPA 5000, which is a code that nobody adopts. And I mean that quite literally, nobody adopts it. So I'd go off of the IBC. That's what everybody in the United States adopts, is the International Building Code. So that's what I go off of. And I'll explain what 3, 4, and 5 here are in just a minute. But for multifamily dwellings, apartments, townhouses, if you're allowed to build them out of type 3, 4, or 5, then you can use NM cable. For other than dwellings, so not one and two family, not multifamily, but you know commercial, industrial, institutional, other than dwelling units that are allowed to be type three, four, or five construction, but 
You have to bury it in the walls or the floors or a ceiling that provides at least a 15 minute finish rating. Essentially, you have to conceal it and you have to cover it with at least half inch drywall, half inch gypsum board. That'll give you a 15 minute finish rating. You cannot have it exposed in other than dwelling units and you can't have it at all in type one or two construction. There's an informational note that says the adopted building code, like the IBC, describes type of construction. I kind of took a screenshot from my own code book and, and showed you what I highlighted. Really what you need to know, you need to know that types one and two are completely non-combustible. Now that's your walls, your roof, your floor ceiling assembly, not just the structural members like the exterior walls, but all the partitions and everything else. Every wall in the building, like you're in a high rise building, we don't let you build wood walls in a 50 story building. It just ain't gonna happen, even if they're not structural, we can't have that much fire fuel in a 50 story building. So types one and two are completely non-combustible. Here's kind of the way you can look at it. For other than dwellings for commercial. If the building has to be non-combustible by the building code, then so does the wiring method. And M cable is combustible. We limit how much combustible stuff you can have in a non-combustible building. You can have combustible, you know, wood handrails or uh, cabinets, stuff like that, but we really limit how much combustible stuff you can have in a non-combustible building. Can't have combustible wiring methods in a non-combustible building. That's kind of the idea here type 3, 4, and 5, you really don't have to get into the differences between 3, 4, and 5 because for our application the rules are the same. You can use it in type 3, 4, and 5. You can't use it in types 1 and 2. So really all you need to know as an electrician, types 1 and 2 are totally non-combustible. Types 3, 4, and 5 allow wood to some extent, to varying extents. Type 3 allows some wood. Type 5 allows complete and total wood. So how much wood? It doesn't matter for us electricians. If there's any wood in the building, you can use NM cable. That's kind of the, the rule of thumb. I know that's overstating it slightly. There's some exceptions. Well, you know, you can put it in cable trays. Kind of strange, but you could. Cable trays in buildings that are allowed to be type 3, 4, or 5 construction if identified for the use. So the cable actually has to be identified for cable tray use. and Identified is a definition in Article 100 that's completely broken. Um, Crystal, if you're still out there, you made a proposal in 2020 that absolutely should have passed to fix the definition of identified. I, I view it the exact same way you do. But this is, you know, we can we can argue about some of the nuances, but but let's get serious here. You put in Romex in a cable tray, in a, <laughs> you know, so you can if you want to, but you know, and then the other one. This is really, um, I think, a philosophical allowance. It, we put it in the code because it should be allowed, but get real, you're never gonna, nobody would ever do this. You can put NM cable in types one and two construction, you know, high rise commercial building, if you install it in a raceway. So you're gonna, you're gonna pipe your whole building with EMT, and then you can pull NM cable through it. Got it. You know, yeah, okay, we'll allow you to do that, but I think we can agree that's a bit absurd. Okay, 334.10a uses permitted specifically for type NM. You see, 334.10 that we just read is for type NM and NMC. These two items are specific to type NM, not NMC. Type NM is allowed where exposed or concealed in dry locations unless prohibited by type of construction. Okay, so yeah, it can be exposed or it can be concealed, but in commercial buildings, of course, it has to be concealed. NM cable is also allowed, number two, in the air voids of masonry block or tile walls. So here I've got this masonry foundation. Usually you can you can figure out which ones are going to be the grouted cells by which ones have the rebar So it looks like we've got every four feet or so and these are the grouted cells can't put NM cable in those You could put them in the non grouted cells however in the air voids of masonry block or tile walls At least we start by saying that we'll figure out if that's true or not Getting into 334.12 use is not permitted and, and again, I, I want to reemphasize 
I'm not going to spend much time on NMC cable. I, I just don't see the value in it. Uses not permitted. Type NM and NMC. Okay, number one. We kind of already said this. Type NM and NMC are prohibited as follows in items 1 through 10. Number one, you cannot use, so read this careful, you cannot use NM cable in any building that's not covered in 334.10. So, okay, now we're going back to type of construction, uses permitted, dwellings, multifamily dwellings, other than dwellings. Number two, this was changed back in 1999. You also cannot use NM cable exposed within dropped or suspended ceilings in other than dwellings. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me why over the years. Why can't you put it above the ceiling in a commercial building? Well, the reason for that from all of my research is, you guys might remember, back in the 90s, there was a three-story cap on where you could use NM cable. You can use it up to three stories, that's it. If it's four stories, no Romex. That was the rule. And then cooler has prevailed and, and logic was applied. And they said, you know, that's kind of dumb. The whole building is built out of wood and it's five stories and you're sweating some 14-2 Romex? Come on. And that's a good point. So they said, no, you know what, we will base it on logic. If you can make the building combustible, you can wire it with combustible wiring. But there are some caveats. Put it behind drywall. I don't want it above the suspended ceiling. Um, I think it's probably a physical damage issue as much as anything, but that was one of the trade-offs. They said, okay, you know what, we'll give you more than three stories, but we're not giving you the space above the ceiling. And there you go. Number three, you can't use it as a substitute for service entrance cable. Uh, I know depending on where you live in the United States, you look at this and, and your head explodes. In Utah, where I live, you would never see this. But in some parts of the country, this is everywhere. Uh, my, my friend Sean from the D.C. area sent this. This is SE cable, and so is this down here. What this rule is saying is, look, you can't, you can't use that for NM cable. You can't use it as service entrance cable. Okay, fine. You cannot use it in commercial garages that have hazardous locations. That makes sense. I mean, it probably has some physical damage concerns and different things. Number five, in theaters and similar, other than in areas that are not fire rated. Um, that's a dicey issue. Um, to be quite honest, most commercial buildings really aren't fire rated anymore. If you classify the building as fire rated, that would be like type 1A versus type 1B or type 5A versus type 5B. That's more than we're going to get into tonight, but really not a lot of buildings are fire rated anymore. So I think in, in a lot of theaters you might be able to, but it's pretty doubtful that we would specify NM cable in such an application. We can't use it in motion picture uh, studios or storage battery rooms. Can't use it here in the storage battery rooms. You cannot use it in or on elevators or their hoistways or escalators. So inside of the uh, elevator hoistway here, no NM cable. You're not allowed to embed it in poured cement, concrete, or aggregate. If you need to do that, then I would suggest you buy UF cable. And then, of course, item 10, hazardous locations, unless specifically permitted. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a, this is a place in Virginia where they, where they uh, the, this is the Continental uh, Auto Place. This is where they test uh, fuel injector systems. So very much a Class 1 location. I mean, this is one of the few actual legitimate Class 1 Division 1 locations that I've been in, where you walk in there smoking a cigarette, it blows up. Yeah, you're not going to use NM cable in there. Although it does say hazardous locations unless specifically permitted. Is it ever specifically permitted? Yes. Article 504 for intrinsic safety says you can use any wiring method you want. So as bizarre as, you, as it would be, if you want to use Romex for intrinsically safe wiring, be my guest. Probably not going to happen. Where can you not use NM cable? Cannot use NM cable where exposed to corrosive vapors or fumes. One of the things that we're really starting to learn about in the code is swimming pools. Uh, you know, let's be honest, man. We we probably weren't taking swimming pool equipment rooms as seriously as we should have. You know, swimming pools still are, are kind of new as far as the any. You know, we haven't been installing swimming pools for hundreds of years. We haven't completely figured it out yet. One thing that we are figuring out 
they're toxic as far as corrosion is concerned. This is a swimming pool equipment room and you can see it's corroded away to nothing. Cannot use NM cable in such a location. For NM, not NMC, but NM, you also cannot embed it in shallow, uh, embed or in shallow chases of masonry, concrete, adobe, fill, or covered with plaster or similar. I've had a lot of inspectors uh, misunderstand or misapply this requirement. It's very common, at least in my area, down in a basement of a house, uh, you'll have the exterior foundation wall, and then beneath the front porch, you'll have a cold storage room. Very common indeed to, to hammer drill a hole through that wall and run some NM cable into the cold storage room for a light. Now that is not embedded in concrete. Embedded in concrete is when I put it you know, in the form and then pour concrete around it. So drilling a hole through the concrete and running the cable through it, that is not embedding it in, in uh, concrete or similar. So that would still be okay. Number four, pretty obvious, damp or wet locations. You know, believe it or not, you can't just, you know, run this underneath the deck of this building. Whether this is a wet location or a damp location, it, it's hard to say. Maybe not enough information, but it doesn't matter. Cannot do that. More subtly, what else is a wet location? You know, we know you go outside, that's probably a wet location or at least a damp location. This is a violation I wrote up dozens of times as an inspector. Uh, we're into basements where I live. So we have, uh, usually when you build a house, you have an unfinished basement. And later on, when somebody would go to finish the basement, they'll often want to have a kitchen down there with an island. And of course, you go into 210.52C and it says if you have an island, you need receptacles in your island. So how do you get that wiring method out to the island in an unfinished basement? Well, you end up saw cutting the floor and then you'll put a PVC conduit sleeve in the, uh, in the floor and then you'll pour back over it. Well, underground is a wet location. Even the inside of the raceway underground is a wet location. If it's underground, and you're like, oh wait, it wasn't underground, it was in the slab. Or if it's in the slab, if the slab is touching dirt. And that's information you'll find in Article 100 under the definition of wet location, and also in 300.5b. So this is a violation. We can't pull NM cable through that raceway because the inside of that raceway is a wet location. The same thing, by the way, could be said for above ground outdoor applications. If this conduit was, uh, was above ground outdoors, that too is a wet location. 300.9 is your code section for that. Let me quickly take a peek at the chat on YouTube first. <laughs> yeah. Da -da -da -da. Milwaukee. Um, 21 store, yes. Okay, so Don, uh, you're saying in Milwaukee they're going to build a high rise out of heavy timber construction, out of wood. And uh, I think it's going to be great, to be honest. Uh, yeah, identified, definitely broken. Um, oh, what is a shallow chase? Um, I don't know that it's defined. I think a shallow chase is. Um, is like when you, if you were to take like a router, you know, and, and route a slot in your surface, whether it's drywall or concrete, or you're probably not going to router your concrete, um, you know, but if you lay it down. Okay, and I was wondering if I misspoke on this, UF is also not allowed to be embedded in concrete. All right, like I said, you can't embed it in concrete. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> All right. So, da -da -da. Uh, great comment. The PVC coated MC cable is a good substitute to PVC to an island. Yeah, I think the PVC MC cable is great stuff. Outstanding. Scott is asking Is the inside of a box outside a wet location? I believe that it is not, personally. Does PVC give off more deadly fumes than NM if you light it on fire, is what Chris DeLong is asking. I don't know. I think they're comparable. Neither of them are plenum rated. Um, this is cool, Ryan. What chroma key setup are you using? Ammon, I don't even know what that means. Um, so Ammon is my guy from Red Vec from Vector Solutions I do online training for. And uh, he's evidently happy with what I'm doing, but I don't know. I have no idea what chroma key is or what I'm using. Let's see. I am the Tiger King of Electrical. Thank you. I don't know what that means either. But uh, all right. Tiger King, yo. I know the Tiger thing is a big deal right now so 
I, uh, I hear he's from Dundalk, though. Quality's good. Okay, perfect. Back to it. Um, oh, right when I left, it looked like somebody was asking, is it okay to pull NM cable through PVC conduit? If the, uh, if the PVC conduit is in a wet location, then no, because the inside of a conduit in a wet location is itself a wet location. Does that make sense? Don says the amount of deadly fumes, um, yeah, from the wiring methods compared to those from the furnishings is so small. I, I agree. I agree. I, I think the plenum rated stuff to a certain extent is a little bit overblown. I hate to admit that, but I agree. Exposed work, 334.15. Yes, you can run NM cable exposed. Of course you can. We got a whole section titled exposed work. How many times have you guys heard that you can't run NM cable exposed? Of course you can. Exposed cables must comply with 334.15A through C. They have to closely follow the surface of the building or the surface of running boards. All right, beautiful installation right there. So we've got uh, following the surface of the running boards. I think that complies. If it's exposed to physical damage, then cables must be protected by a raceway or other approved means. Okay, um, that's a tough one, if it's exposed to physical damage. Um, I'm going to say a joke that I often say in class, and it, it sounds, you know, it was a Supreme Court justice that said this on the record, and it's, it's kind of a funny statement, but it's very true. Uh, you guys might remember in the 90s when the internet was first kind of starting to take off uh, and the, the super, we didn't know how to regulate it. You know, what, what should be regulated, how free should the internet be? And there was a big debate quite, you know, about, about online pornography. And there was a Supreme Court justice that says, look, I can't define what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. And I don't know if he meant it to come out that way, but it was pretty funny. But but really, it's a good point. I don't know how to define physical damage. You can't define physical damage, but you know it when you see it. That's the only thing, you know. So a lot of people say, well, what's physical damage? I don't know. You, you can't possibly define it. Somebody has to make the choice. Somebody has to make the determination of what physical damage is. So do you need to put these sleeves inside of the cabinetry? I don't know. Uh, that's up to your authority having jurisdiction. Is this underneath this cabinet uh, subject to physical damage? I don't know. Uh, that again, you'd have to ask your authority having jurisdiction. I tend to be um, I tend to be fairly um, fairly liberal on my on my views on this. Uh, I, I I don't get too concerned about. I, I don't I don't see knives and things falling out of the back of a drawer and cutting the cable. I, it's just something that I don't see. But. There are others who have strong feelings about it, and, and that's okay too. You know, uh, sometimes you, you just have to ask the AHJ what is or is not subject to physical damage. 334.15b, protection from physical damage, where exposed, and make sure you read those first two words, because I've had inspectors that, that said you had to do this throughout the whole building. No, where exposed. Cables penetrating a floor must be protected by a raceway that extends at least six inches up through the floor or by other approved means. Okay, so this is obviously an exposed NM cable. This is underneath a cabinet and this is for a disposal. We've got our switched receptacle. So it penetrates through the floor from the basement and we have to have some sort of a raceway that extends up at least six inches. In this application, we decided to extend the raceway pretty much all the way up to the box to add that additional protection. Does it need to go all the way to the box? I don't think so. I, I think that's okay. Now, a lot of people get hung up on the issue of physical damage. Can you use electrical non-metallic tubing, ENT, where it's subject to physical damage? No. So are we looking at a violation here? Well, you can't, you put the NM cable in a pipe because the NM cable is exposed to physical damage, but you used a pipe that can't be subject to physical damage. Well, wait a minute now. Subject to physical damage is not just a function of the location, it's a function of the wiring method. What's likely to physically damage NM cable might not necessarily damage ENT. You know, and what might damage ENT may or may not damage flexible metal conduit. So I don't think we can just look at it and say, hey, listen, that's an area subject to physical damage. No, that's an area where NM cable 
would be subject to physical damage. It's maybe not an area where electrical metallic tubing would be subject to physical damage. So we need to, we need to consider that as well. We also have some requirements for unfinished basements and crawl spaces that say cables smaller than 6.2 or 8.3 must be installed through bored holes of the floor joist. Larger cables, however, can be secured to the bottom of the joist. All right, so here in my area, we use engineered wood joists, and it makes it nice and easy. Those, those of you electricians that have never, you know, that, that still like have 2x10s and 2x12s, you guys have no idea what you're missing. These holes here are like pre-drilled. You don't even, you don't even have a drill when you wire a house. Well, you do for the upstairs. But um, yeah, you just run these things through the perforated holes, done deal. From my understanding, and I was told this by Mark Ody, and Mark Ody, nobody's perfect. Mark Ody's not wrong very often. And Brian, Don, you know, Crystal, you guys that know Mark, I think you'll agree. He, he's not wrong too often. He told me that the history of this, why it has to be installed through joists, is actually because of people hanging coat hangers on the cable. Could you see that happening? You've got your laundry in your unfinished basement, and you're folding clothes, and you're like, you're hanging up your coat. You know, I could totally see that. And in fact, my friend Manny, who I think was streaming, he showed me a picture. He's in Chicago, so his house is piped. His house is EMT. Guess what? him and his wife do when they do laundry. They hang their clothes on the exposed EMT. Would they do that if it was Romex? Probably. Well, yeah, I know Manny. Yeah, probably. He would. <laughs> so that's where it comes from, according to Mark Ody. And, and I, I think it makes some sense. Cables may be protected by raceways that have a bushing on their end. Interesting that this is only unfinished basements and crawl spaces. You'd think it would be anywhere. But cables can be protected by raceways that have a bushing or a fitting on their end. The cable sheath must remain continuous all the way through the raceway and be secured within 12 inches of where it comes out of the raceway. So you can't strip the cable and push it through here. You can't change wiring methods, okay? You're, you didn't change from NM cable to EMT. This is just some physical protection. You still have to follow the rules for NM cable. So push that cable down through there, put a fitting, secure it within 12 inches, good to go quickly check my chat. I'm going to find out I was wrong about the coat hanger thing. Let's see. The amount is this, uh, uh, yep, everybody's talking about Manny. <laughs> um, let's see. Rigid. Didn't tell. Okay. Oh, Don says I would never even consider living in a building with engineered joists. Uh, well, yeah, you'd light a building with engineered joists on fire, it burns down in five minutes. Absolute fact. And that's why in the, uh, in the residential code, you're actually required to put half-inch gyp board over exposed uh, engineered wood products. Crystal, you've heard the coat hurt hanger thing too? Good. I'm glad I'm not completely alone in that. So, back over to here. Over to here. Is that why we use running boards? Yes. So, uh, Al, great question. So if you're on the underside of the floor joists, you can go on the underside of the floor joists if you put running boards next to them. You know why? Because you'll hang your coat hanger on what? The running board. So, yeah. Da -da -da -da. Is that a house? Okay. So it is a little bit tricky to catch all the uh, YouTube com or all of the uh, Facebook comments. It looks like we're pretty happy. So Mark Early, no big deal. Mark, how are you? I hope you're enjoying retirement, as they call it. I can see that you're not nearly as retired as uh, as one might think. Let's keep rolling. Three thirty-four point seventeen through or parallel to framing members. All right. Cables must be protected in accordance with 300.4 as it relates to nail plates and grommets. So here is a grommet here, a listed grommet at that. Why are we doing this? Well, to satisfy 300.4. 300.4 says where subject to physical damage, conductors, raceways, and cables must be protected. Beautiful example of why we're doing this. Here's that cable, or pardon me, a nail, <laughs> a nail that has pierced the jacket of the cable. And I want you to notice something too, if you can see it. 
that nail is not from drywall. That's not from the inside of the house. That's from the outside of the house. I can see oriented strand board, OSB. So that actually came from the outside, like the stucco guy or somebody hit it. Probably not stucco with 16 penny nails. But um, I want you to remember that, that uh, the inch and a quarter rule that we're going to talk about applies from both sides of the framing member from the inside and the drywall installer and from the outside with the stucco installer. We get, we, we get a lot of problems of, uh, of stucco contractors hitting cables in my area. So, board holes, 300.4A1, we're talking about wood. Holes for wiring in wood members must be in, uh, one and a quarter inches from the face of the stud or rafter, etc. Or the hole must be covered with a steel plate that's at least a sixteenth inch thick. So, drill it in the middle of the stud and that's all you've got to worry about. Now I want to point out, somebody sent me this photograph and they were upset. They said, oh man, this stupid inspector is making me put nail plates. Look at this. It's an inch and three quarters from the hole. You don't measure from the middle of the hole. You measure from the edge of the hole. So the inspector was absolutely correct. So you measure from the edge of the hole for this inch and a quarter rule. There's, uh, there's, one, there's two exceptions. The first exception doesn't apply to NM cable, and that's why I'm not going to cover it. But it says, you know, if you're using conduits, EMT, you don't need nail plates. The next, the next exception, nail plates that are thinner than a sixteenth of an inch are allowed if they're listed and marked. Well, there is our listing, and as you can see, you cannot possibly penetrate a listed nail plate with a drywall screw. So <laughs> that's the idea, anyway. You know, don't. Uh, I think the drywaller is like, oh, really? Well, hold my beer. 300.4B, non-metallic sheathed cable. If non-metallic sheathed cables pass through slots or holes in metal members, such as what we're looking at here, listed grommets or bushings that are installed prior to the cable being installed are required. So I have to have some sort of a bushing or a grommet to protect my cable, and that makes perfect sense. If you've ever pulled MC cable through metal studs, you know the racket that it makes as it drags through the hole. You can imagine that pulling NM cable through steel studs, you would just end up with a nice big wad of white plastic when you're done. 300.4B2 talks about not only NM cable, but also electrical non-metallic tubing, or ENT, Smurf tube as some people call it. If nails or screws are likely to penetrate NM cable or ENT, a plate or similar, at least a 16th inch thick, must be installed. Now this is for metal stud framing. Only applies to NM cable and ENT. It does not apply to MC cable or any raceways or any raceways other than ENT. Here's one that um, I think you can this is a tough rule, let me just say this. I, I think it makes a lot of sense, um, but I think you could really kind of get into some trouble with it. Wiring that's parallel to framing members and furring strips. So 300.4A talks about it perpendicular when we drill holes through the furring strips. And then uh, B talks about metal. And then subsection D says where screws or nails are likely to penetrate, Wiring must be at least an inch and a quarter from the edge of framing members or furring strips where installed parallel to them. What we're looking at here is a violation. If the, uh, if the drywall guy can miss hitting a stud, and you know, a lot of us have hung drywall in our basements or whatever, you don't always hit the stud, man. Sometimes you miss. Uh, if that happens and you go right into the cable, well, that's a problem. So we do require an inch and a quarter separation. It has to be back from the face. So if, this is my stud. It has to be back at least an inch and a quarter or away an inch and a quarter one or the other either way it's got to be away from it at least an inch and a quarter so this is a violation here this cable runs right next to the stud that is a violation they should have like the little stacky boys or whatever they're called uh, I wanted to say caterpillars but they're not caterpillars you know the little stacky guys so keep those things an inch and a quarter away from the framing member here's where I think a person could get in trouble and do I want to say this or not because I hope no inspectors are watching if there's inspectors watching the electricians watching are probably going to kill me I think it's probably a violation to use the closest knockout on a single on a box unless you hang a nail plate halfway over the edge of the stud you violate this rule now if you want to go that far if we're concerned about the cable going into the box what about the box itself? 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Should we should we like cantilever, you know, hang nail plates halfway out to cover the box? Uh, I think it's a stretch. I haven't I've never seen any documented incidents of it being a problem, but who knows? You know that that's what the rule says. This is a photograph somebody sent me. This is a practice that you don't see in my area, but in a lot a lot of places in the country, this is exactly how you would see it. Uh, I mentioned cables have to be through holes in the joist. Well, nobody wants to drill a bunch of holes, so they'll install running boards instead, and they'll, they'll fur out the basement ceiling. Does this comply? Absolutely. That is an inch and a quarter from the edge of the framing member or furring strip where you're going to be installing the nails. You're not installing nails in the joists. You're installing nails in the furring strip. Is that an inch and a quarter from the furring strip? Yes, so it complies. This installation is perfectly fine. That complies. Of course, I don't need to install nail plates for concealed work in finished buildings or prefabricated buildings when I'm fishing the cable. I mean, how could you possibly do that, number one? And number two, what's the hazard? The drywall's already there. They're not gonna be, you know, they're not gonna be screwing through it. So, kind of an obvious exception. 334.23, wiring in accessible attics. Okay, here's a rule that I was wrong about for 20 years. And this is one of those things, you guys that are instructors, Chuck, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. This is one of those things, man, where you, you, you're talking in front of a group of people and all of a sudden the guy in the back, first year apprentice, been on the job for two weeks, raises his hand. And that's the guy you need to watch. You, you need to watch out. The guy that raises his hand and he starts quoting product standards, that's always scary in your class. And you're like, okay, security, get this guy out of here. He knows what he's talking about. The other scary guy in a class, the guy who knows nothing because he'll take you to school. So I'm teaching a class, guy that knows nothing raises his hand. And he goes, that's not what the code says. And I'm like, of course it is. You know, and I grab my book. Of course that's what it says. And I'm like, oh. I've been wrong for 20 years. I was absolutely wrong about what this rule says. So 334.23, it refers you back to 320.23, but let me tell you what it says. Cables on the floor or the walls of attics must be protected by guard strips throughout the whole attic. And that protection extends from the floor of the attic up vertically seven feet. The seven foot dimension is a vertical dimension. The whole attic has to be protected if you have permanently installed stairs or ladder. So if I can get up there, every stitch of wiring in that attic has to be protected from the floor up seven feet. I always read this as the seven foot being a horizontal dimension. It's not. It's the entire attic space has to be protected from the floor up seven feet. Now, in my area, it's quite rare to see a permanently installed stair or uh, stairway or whatever that was called, ladder. So in my area, you have an attic access like this or scuttle hole, depending on what part of the country you're in. If you have access to the attic that is not permanent, right, not stairs, not a permanently installed pull down ladder, then you still have to protect everything from the floor going up seven feet, but only within six feet of the attic access. In other words, I get up into the attic, for the first six feet, I need to be walking on wood, not wires. So guard strips, something to protect it. And if, and, and it's not something I would see very often, uh, in my area, but if I had the NM cable installed up higher, you know, like three feet above the attic floor, then I would have to have running boards along it as well to protect it. So if I fall or if I, you know, um, but again, if there's no permanent stair, it's only within six feet. If there is a permanent stair, the whole attic from the floor measured vertically seven feet. Let me know if you guys knew that or not, because I was wrong on that for 20 years. Guard strips have to be at least as high as the cable. Makes sense. So you can see here, I enter my attic access and I'm gonna be walking around. So, in order to satisfy this rule, we have installed these guard strips. What we always just use is two by fours. You throw a two by four up in the attic, 
and that way I can walk on it and not on the wire. Uh, Don Ganier, you sent me this picture. Um, here's one where you walk like the regular, you know, carpeted stairs. And you go up into a bonus room, is what I've always called them. Then you open the door, and you've got all this attic space. Every single wire in that attic has to be protected because that's accessed by a permanently installed ladder or stair. I need running boards along all of those cables. The only time I would not need to do that is if they were up on the rafters seven feet high. All right. I'm curious. Maybe I was the only one dumb enough that I didn't understand that. So, I'm curious here. Stackers, cover the box, stickers, yep. So did you, six thing, yeah. Learn something new, same here, yep. IBW332, right on. I'm not, personally, I'm not an IBW guy. I never was, but that's awesome, man. It works great for some people, not for everybody, but uh, Julian, welcome to the industry, man. Anybody in the trade is a brother of mine, so good to see you. Let's uh, take a look here. That one, we're good. When did this go into effect? The attic thing? Oh, I don't know, 30 years ago? <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> it's been there forever, man, as far as I'm concerned. Let's keep on going. 334.24. Bending radius. Bending radii, I like to say radii. I don't know, it's just a word I enjoy saying. Bends must not damage the cable sheath. First and foremost, if you, if you bend it and you, you damage the cable sheath, that's a violation. Also, the inner radius of the curve of a bend must be at least five times the diameter of the cable. I'll give you another uh, interesting thing that happens. When you're talking about residential stuff at a industrial site, you get really good questions. Somebody raised his hands, right? I'm teaching at the power plant you know, 1900 megawatt power plant. You think they have Romex? Give me a break. Dude raises his hand. He's like, Ryan, what's the radius of a flat cable? And I'm like, uh, next. <laughs> it made me start thinking and I really started to analyze this. So I, I'm like, you know what? I don't know, but I will find out. And like, I wanted to find out that night. So I go online and everything. And I went to, I think Southwire and I got uh, I got a table that showed the dimensions of their cable. So let's look at the top two, 14.2 and 12.2. The diameter is 0 0.17 on the skinny side by 0 0.390 on the fat side. So then I started thinking, okay, well, I guess I use the worst case scenario and I base it on the fat edge of the cable. But that doesn't make any logical sense really because the idea here is I want to make sure I'm not damaging the cable jacket when I make a bend. So if I'm bending it, you know, the, the normal way that we would bend it, then it's the thickness this way that I'm concerned with. And that's the smaller dimension. So I thought, okay, what is 0 0.17 times 5 the diameter of the cable? What does that even mean? I, and I, I do the math and it's 1.7. And I'm like, Okay, I have no idea what that means. I mean, I know what 1.7 inches is, but I, I, I need something else. I, got, I can't understand this. So I thought, okay, what else is 1.7 diameter? A golf ball. I looked online. Like, there's got to be something that's a golf ball. So here's the deal. The bending radius for 14.2 or 12.2 is 1.7. And the 1.7 diameter, radius of 0.85, radius is half the diameter, right? So the diameter is 1.7. A golf ball is 1.7. This complies. You cannot bend NM cable tighter than, than you could around a golf ball. Does that make sense? So this complies. Any tighter would be a violation. And really, you think about that, that's pretty tough to violate, in all honesty. If, I, if I'm drilling a, a 2x4 stud and I drill a hole through it, I come up and make that turn, I don't think I need it to to really sweep out like uh, like this installation here. Uh oh, I'm dropping frames. What's going on here? Um, are we having issues on the feed? Let's see here. I'm not getting any bad feedback, so 
Okay, we're good? Okay, cool. So, on the bending radius, I don't think we necessarily have to have this big sweeping radius. I think it's a great installation, but I'm not sure that it's required. As long as you're not bending it tighter than a golf ball, I think you're good to go. And then, of course, I just took it way too far, you know, that because that's what I do. Um, it, it's like, you know, it, it's like uh, politicians. They do one of two things. They take a, a good idea and run it into the ground, or they take a bad idea and run it into the ground. So here we've got a golf ball is like 1.7. Uh, if I had 10.2, that's similar to like a tennis ball. So 10.2, if this was 10.2, don't bend it tighter than a tennis ball, you know, and you know, baseball for 8.2, and, uh, and then I started really stretching it. I'm like, okay, 8.3 is a grapefruit, and 2.3 is a basketball. But anyway, uh, exceeding the bending radius for smaller cables, I think is actually more difficult to do than I initially thought. This is not a violation that complies. That is not uh, an excess bending radius. Even though you can start to see the cable starting to ripple down at the bottom, that's still not a violation. 334.30, securing supporting. Cables must be secured and supported by staples or by cable ties that are listed and identified for securing and supporting. We'll talk about that next. Or straps or hangers or other ways that don't damage it. You know, just secure it and support it however you want, just don't damage the cable. That, that's pretty much the rule here. So staples like this, not a problem. If you're in Massachusetts, you need the insulated ones. If you're in the rest of the world, just regular old staples is perfectly fine. Um, as far as I know, you know, if you have state amendments, then you might, but uh, as far as NEC is concerned, use just regular staples. It's fine. How many can you put under a staple? Whatever they're designed for. This one says it's, you know, two conductor, 10, and however many you can stick. When it comes to using cable ties, they added some specific text in the 2017 code. Support hardware does not need to be listed. However, cable ties for support hardware do need to be listed. There's cable ties and then there's cable ties. You guys have probably all installed cable ties that are junk. You're, you're, you're just tightening the cable tie and they break. Well look, if you want to put that under your desk or behind your TV, fine. You're not going to use that to support the wiring of a building. You got to use the good cable ties for the wiring of a building. They have to be listed. That's requirement number one. And you can see in this, uh, in this zoom in here, this is a listed product but it also has to be identified for securing and supporting, and that's a separate requirement. So it has to be listed, and it has to be identified for securing and supporting. Well, how do I know that it is? Type 221, 2S, 21S, those letter S, that's how you know it's identified for securing and supporting. 21S and 2S are the good ones. Those are the ones that are identified for securing and supporting. Flat cables must not be stapled on edge. Makes sense. When you look at this picture here, you can see what would happen if we if we struck that one more time with a hammer blow, we'd really have a significant issue. One thing I will say though, kind of going off topic, love or hate AFCIs and you're welcome to your opinion. I'm here to tell you because I inspected before and after AFCIs got in the code. They changed the way people staple. They really did. Before AFCIs, it was a 28 ounce framing hammer and throw those staples on. After AFCIs, it was like nice and easy and make sure you don't destroy the cable. So be careful when you're stapling. New to the 2020 code, we have this clarification. Cables have to be supported and secured every four and a half feet and within 12 inch, uh, inches of entry into the enclosures or fittings. Now that's been in the code for a long time, but how do you measure that 12 inches? It was clarified in the 2020, the length of the cable from the box to the first support must not exceed 18 inches of cable length. So this cable, as the crow flies, needs to be secured within 12 inches and 18 inches of cable length. If you want to install one of these little loop-de-loops, and I, like, I don't know why people do I, I never saw one of these in my life. But in some areas, man, everybody is all about the little loop-de-loop, -loop, and if that's your world, hey, keep on putting them in. doesn't bother me. Just make sure you secure it within 18 inches. Moving on, cables that are installed horizontally in holes or notches of framing members are considered both secured and supported. It's important to realize there's two rules here. Number one, have to support your cable. Number two, have to secure your cable. Two different rules. When you put it through holes in wood framing like that, through framing members, that's considered both secured and supported. 
as long as the uh, spacings of the framing member don't exceed four foot six, but you still have to secure it within 12 inches of the box, so be careful on that. There's also an informational note in this section, and I think it's a good one, that says, hey man, while you're here, look at 314.17b for box securing requirements at outlet boxes, for I should say cable securing requirements. Um, what that section says is it says the cable sheath of UF or NM cable must extend into the enclosure at least a quarter of an inch beyond any cable clamps and cables and raceways must be secured to the enclosure. So you have to secure the cable to the box. You have to secure the cable to the box. But there's an exception. For single gang boxes, oh, I'm getting a message that says the feed sucks. Thank you. Glad I saw that. Um, let me quickly hit a button. And let's dial this thing back to that. Okay. Um, thank you, Lee. Appreciate that. Feed is fine. I, I'm, I'm seeing a problem on my end, too. So thank you, Lee, for saying that. Okay, so the general rule is you have to secure the cable to the box. There's an exception for single gang boxes, not two gang, not three gang, but only single gang. UF or NM cables are not required to be secured to the box if the cable is secured within eight inches of the box. So the general rule is secure the cable within 12. However, if you don't want to secure the cable to the box and it's a single gang box and you secure it within eight inches, then you're okay. All right, one more thing and then I'll check the comments. Unsupported cables. Cables fished in concealed locations of finished buildings do not require securing and supporting. Makes sense. And if, if Chris is still online, I think he sent me this picture. So this is a, a finished building. They just used a hole saw, you know, to cut holes and then they'll end up uh, replacing those. Hopefully they didn't hole saw a five inch hole right through that floor joist. I never noticed that. That probably sucks. Um, but you know, assuming that's not a floor joist, then we're okay. You don't have to secure and support your wires. Let's take a peek at the comments. I'm concerned that it's going to say how the feed got really terrible. Let's see. Good to know, dough, cable tie smoke issue, feed sucks. 334.30 wiring device without a separate outlet box. I'll hit that next. Um, the board Would the board hole satisfy the code? Yes, for securing and supporting uh, other than within 12 inches of the box. Uh, Romex jockey needs a hammer no larger than 16 ounces. You're talking to an ex-framer, dude. Mine's 28 ounces. Always has been. <laughs> I can barely swing it anymore, but, you know. Ryan's Max Headroom Show. Thank you. I have no idea what that means. I'm guessing like a stuttering Max Headroom kind of thing. And over to here. Feeds good. Why the difference between scuttle access and permanent access? Okay, Derek, great question. Um, mo we're electricians. We're not afraid of getting in the attic because that's just kind of part of the job. Um, homeowners are not going to get up in the attic unless there's a permanent stair. If there's a permanent stair, they're going up there and they will walk everywhere through it. And I'm dropping frames again. Is that right? So homeowners are going to walk around in the attic if they can. So we need to make sure we're protecting them. Okay. Bad feed, bad feed. Okay, hopefully the feed just got caught up. I think it did. Can you use these videos for continuing education? Man, only if you pay me, Nate. Come on, dog. I'd like to eat too. 334.40, boxes and fittings. Non-metallic boxes may be used with non-metallic cable. <laughs> yeah, you can use plastic boxes with your plastic wiring. Not a problem. Devices of insulating material. See, I keep on dropping those frames. Let me just make one more change here. I'm going to drop this down on the bit rate. Listed NM cable interconnector devices without a box are allowed for splicing exposed cables or for repairing concealed cables in existing locations. Okay, so this is the fitting that we're talking about. And I actually have one of these little guys here in my hand. Um, this allows me to make a splice of NM cable and then bury the splice behind the wall. And I know some people get 
outraged over that whole concept, and I get it. But here's the thing. Let me just ask you guys a question. Do you think people splice NM cable with wire nuts and tape and bury it behind the wall? And we've all seen it. We've all seen it. Hopefully we haven't all done it, but we've all seen it. People are going to splice and bury the splice. It's going to happen. We might as well design a product that we know is safe and test it and get it listed and let people do it because it's going to happen anyway. You know what I mean? It's going to happen. So let's figure out a way to do it safely. These guys have been around for 50 years. They, you, they were used in manufactured homes. So you uh, it's kind of tough to see. Probably just better that you look at it on the, on the screen here. But you lay your hot equipment ground neutral in there and then you push them together, you make the splice, bury it in the wall. They're fine, not a problem, it's better than this. That's really what we're trying to say. So I have no issue with them. You can buy them at Home Depot and Lowe's, not a problem. Devices with integral enclosures, I think is what uh, Barry was asking about. And that's what this guy is. This is something that you would also see in manufactured homes. This is the um, this is the the not having a box, but you kind of have a box. It's an integral enclosure. So this is what it looks like on the inside. This is what it looks like from inside of the wall. Same thing here. Here's my switch. Here is the back of my switch. It's an integral enclosure. 334.80 ampacity. All right. NM cable is constructed of 90 degree C conductors, has to be, but the 60 degree column of table 310.16 must be used to determine its final ampacity. So for example, here I've got these beautiful, and they are beautiful, 12-2 cables. If I go to 310.16, they are in fact rated 30 amps. However, we're going to pretend that they're only good for 20 amps because that's what this section says. They're 90 degree wires, but pretend that they're 60 degrees. I think that that, my opinion, is that's to protect people from themselves. Um, we don't like people taking out 20 amp breakers and replacing them with 30 amp breakers, so we kind of have a little bit of wiggle room here to prevent people from killing themselves. And my uh, feed is getting weird again. I apologize. I really, I'll have to figure out how to address that because I don't know that I can go much lower on my bitrate. Guys, let me know if that just looks dreadful. I'm hoping it's not. Uh, Crystal says, those interconnector devices are very useful when houses have been flooded and the receptacle and wiring below the flood line have to be replaced. That's a great point, actually. That's a really good application. Oh, and in fact, uh, Dave said that as well. So yeah, a lot of people are saying that. Um, <laughs> Lloyd says, showing your age, Max Headroom, right? Yeah, from the 80s. Um, I'll tell you where else you can use that little uh, splicing device. What if you have an old house that has 60 degree rated NM cable, where the actual cable is 60 degrees or 75 degrees? If you buy a new light, um, if you buy a new luminaire, one of the things you'll notice is it says you have to have uh, 90 degree conductors. So how do you deal with that if you have to change your light and your house doesn't have 90 degree conductors? Well, splice on one of those things to your new 90 degree conductors. So let me, uh, let me do this. I'm going to close a couple of things and hopefully that gets better. What if we installed 90 degree conductors at the terminations and 60 degree NM cables in between? Yeah, you're fine, um, Manny. You can, uh, we treat the ends of the conductors different than the middle of the conductors. So for your luminaire, yeah, if your luminaire says you need 90 degree wires, splice on some 90 degree wires using one of these interconnector devices. I think you want to go about two feet of cable, push that thing up in the attic where you made the splice, good to go. It, it's, it's a solution that otherwise doesn't really exist. All right, let's get back to this. Oops. If multiple cables go through the same wood framing opening, the ampacity must be adjusted if the hole is sealed with anything. Fire caulk, insulation, ceiling foam, bubble gum, doesn't matter. You have to apply an ampacity adjustment. So how many, hole, how many wires can you fit through a hole? As many as you want. However, 
if those wires are touching each other and you seal up the hole, then you will have to apply an opacity adjustment. So here in this application, we have three 14-2 cables. That's six current carrying conductors. You always count the neutral on a two-wire circuit. Don't have to count it usually if it's shared neutral. Six current carrying conductors. I go to table 310.15C1 and I find out that six current carrying conductors is a 0.8 adjustment factor. Take my 90 degree ampacity, multiply that by 0.8, and that is your final adjusted ampacity. And as long as that ampacity, you treat it uh, like you would, then you're okay. So three 14.2s, 25 amps times 0.8 equals 20 amps. Can I put a 20 amp wire on a 15 amp breaker like I was going to anyway? Of course, so you're good to go. Where multiple cables are installed in thermal insulation, spacing must be maintained or the ampacity has to be adjusted in accordance with the ampacity adjustment requirements. Well, yeah, but that's true whether we're in thermal insulation or not. Anytime I install multiple cables without maintaining spacing, you have to apply an ampacity adjustment. You can't, I hate that word bundled because the code doesn't use it, but you can't run a bundle of cables longer than two feet, right? Or you have to apply ampacity adjustment, whether that's in thermal insulation or otherwise. Just about done, 334.104 is a section that I never really covered until the 2020 code because something kind of cool happened. The power and lighting conductors in type NM cable uh, are size 14 gauge copper or 12 gauge aluminum all the way up through 2 gauge copper or 2 gauge aluminum. I never covered that was because it was like, well, who cares? That's for the manufacturers and uh, whatever. But in the 2020 code, we addressed this new really cool product, this twin cable or Siamese cable that you could use for lighting control. Control and signaling conductors must be at least 18 gauge copper. So here I've got my 12 gauge wires, the two insulated conductors and the, is this bare? No, it's covered. Go to article 100 and see what the definition of conductor comma covered is. And then I've got my signaling circuit here, two 18 gauge conductors that are purple and gray, which we would normally use for like zero to 10 volt dimming. Not sure how often you would use that with NM cable, that's kind of a commercial thing, at least for right now, but there's certainly other lighting control options where this could be a real nice, uh, a real nice option. So they do manufacture it, complies with the separation requirements in 725.136 because this is all NM cable. Uh, do you need separation between NM cable and like a thermostat cable? No, the cables could be touching each other and that's essentially what we have here even though this is more robust than a thermostat cable, it actually is non-metallic sheath cable. So kind of a cool little solution. Certainly not gonna run your whole house in it, but I think there's places where you could really utilize it. Uh, you can see here too on the photograph, 12 gauge ground type NMB-PCS cable, power control signaling, I think. Conductors under this jack at the bottom one are only for signaling and control connections. There you go, kind of a cool cable. And then the last thing that we're going to cover tonight is 334.112 insulation, which we kind of already talked about. Insulated conductors in type NM cables must be rated 90 degrees C. Not an option. You cannot manufacture NM cable that's only rated 60 or 75. And then we have a useful informational note here that says cables with the suffix dash B, NMB, meet this requirement. So if I have NMB, then I know that is a 90 degree conductor. If you're interested in more information, you can go to my website, check out some of the books that I've written. If you're so inclined, if you like these graphics, this is what I use in the book. If you're an instructor and you need PowerPoints, go to my website or send me an email and, uh, and we'll talk. I do sell PowerPoints as well. So with that said, I've had a great time. I hope you guys did too. I'm gonna hang out with you guys here for just a little bit longer though and answer any questions that you might have. So, getting on to the YouTube chat here, let's take a look. Does the ampacity adjustment apply only if they touch? Manny, if you read 334.80, you will see that it is uh, only if they don't maintain spacing. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Chris says, will the gray wires go away for dimming? Great point. Yes, they will. 410.69, I think, in the 2020 code. Yeah. Uh, Chuck, you want to talk about PowerPoints? Yeah, let's do it, man. Get in touch with me. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Julian. And over here.
great presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thanks so much. Appreciate you. So we got that. <laughs> Code is just the minimum. He screams. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, can these be used with old wire, no ground, or reduced ground? So, Chico, I'm guessing you're talking about the interconnector things. Uh, you have to be careful with that. If you go to 250.130C, as in Charlie, it has specific rules for extensions of branch circuit wiring. And basically, if you're extending old two-wire circuits, you have to extend it with a three-wire cable, and that, that ground wire has to go somewhere. You can't, uh, you can't just put in a GFCI. All right, so if you're replacing two wire receptacles, go ahead and use a GFCI usually. But if you're extending the wiring, that that bare wire has to actually go to something. It has to go to an equipment grounding conductor terminal, grounding electrode system. Again, if you go to 250.130C, uh, you'll see the list of items. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So define spacing. Love you, Don. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. All right. Do more tomorrow, please. Man, I can't hang out with you guys all day. I got a life. Come on, Sam. I got a beer to drink. <laughs> I'd love to do it every day, man, but uh, I got to make money too. So, sorry. Great review. Oh, thanks for uh, William from the uh, Cape, and, uh, Cape and Island chapter. Outstanding. I think um, Cape and Island chapter. Fred Hartwell. Uh, Char Charlie. Uh, I can't remember his name. But uh, yeah, I know some of the guys from there. Um, thank you. Awesome, learn some stuff. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks so much for all the compliments. Really appreciate you guys. Oh, 334.40B is only for concealed wiring. Yeah, concealed or repair wiring. Yeah, yeah, you can't just do, you can't put these things palmieri. That's it, thanks William. Uh, you can't just like put these things in a new house, but really, I mean, you wouldn't anyway. But, um, what about um, what about putting them like where you have uh, damage to your cables from like vandalism in a new construction? Yeah, that's a tough one. Let's see here. Uh, secure Romex as entering EMT. I'm not sure what that means. Two questions from earlier. Can you use NM for temporary wiring during construction? Love that question. Absolutely you can. If you go to 590.4, I think, it says that you can use NM cable uh, regardless of height of building or type of construction. You can absolutely use it for temporary wiring. Yes, great question. And let's see what else we have. Thanks for the updates. Link, yeah, Palmieri, thank you. When you come back this way, you have to get the plant tour. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, can, I, <laughs> can I define spacing? No, can't define spacing. Uh, as long as they're not touching, then there probably there is spacing, I would say. It's kind of like in Article 310. I think it's 310, used to be 310.15b says that, uh, that you have to maintain spacing between raceways, like EMT or PVC. doesn't tell you how much spacing. just says you have to do it. So, yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes it's not quite that way. Okay, John says Fred's in Western Mass. Okay, George, thank you. The radius of 14.2 is 0.85 tighter than a golf ball. But that's the radius though. The diameter of a golf ball is 1.7. That's the diameter and a radius is half the diameter which is 0.85. So unless my math is wrong and it very well could be, uh, then I think we're okay, George. Double check my math. Can I define HACR? I can. Heating, air conditioning, refrigeration. How does HACR work? I'm not going to define that. <laughs> you need to talk to an HACR guy if you want to know like the actual theory of how air conditioning works. I know a little bit about it, but I'm certainly not going to try to answer any questions. Um, any issues on installing NM cable in cold conditions? Um, no, I don't, I don't think there's any restrictions. There's certainly no code requirements. Um, let me say this, though. Um, if you go to 110.2, 10, 110.11, second paragraph, there is a specific section that says uh, that you can use any wiring method during the course of construction, but it's not allowed to get damaged. So you're not allowed to have your NM cable damaged during the course of construction. 
there you go. So really, that's the only rule. It, it doesn't tell you how to deal with that. You know, on a cold morning, yeah, man, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. We, we see cold mornings for sure. Um, so yeah, just don't, just don't damage it. That's really all that you can say. All right. Oh, Jim Rogers is okay. He's on panel four, I think. I'm, I met Jim a couple years ago. Um, let's see. Was there another question, Chris? There was the temporary wiring during construction. And then I thought you said there was two questions from earlier that I didn't see. Can you believe we don't derate conductors in single and two family dwellings in Wisconsin? Um, sure, man, I can believe a lot of stuff. Um, I don't, so when it comes to, to derating ampacity adjustment, um, Okay, so cable manufacturers recommend not installing PVC insulation jacket at less than 14F. And that's information that you would find. And, and by the way, when Crystal says that, she's a cable manufacturer. She, she knows what she's talking about. And, and Chris, that is true for uh, thermoplastic insulation, right? Not, not just the cable sheath, but uh, THWN. Uh, okay, okay, perfect. So, yeah, not colder than 14 um, and then, uh, what is it, like XHHW, cross-linked polyethylene, is okay colder than 14 degrees F, I think. But, uh, yeah, uh, whatever I just said, thermoplastic is not. Is it thermoplastic? That's not the phrase. What is the, t what is the thing you can't use colder than 14 F? It's not thermoplastic. It's, uh, I don't know, the polymer or whatever it is. Oh, it is thermoplastic. Okay, cool. All right, got one right. Yay. Jason Sabo joined. Hey, Jason, how are you? Okay. Seeing lots of things. All right. Learning. Awesome, Robert. I'm not seeing any more questions. Guys, I've had a great time. I hope you guys did, too. I've uh, definitely enjoyed talking with you guys. I hope you don't mind my uh, my social distancing haircut here. I normally don't, don't quite look this bad. But, um... I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up.